Hi, I'm Dr. Anne Marie Morris. I'm the Director of Child Neurology and Pediatric Sleep Medicine at Geisinger Janet Weiss Children's Hospital. My background is I'm a neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology and then also fellowship trained and board certified in sleep medicine. In regards to central disorders of hypersomnolence, which narcolepsy is specifically one of those conditions, this is an area of expertise for myself and really an area of focus. These are rare disorders that very frequently are, are affecting our children and adolescents as an onset, but unfortunately are frequently delayed in diagnosis and not until adulthood. For that reason, I do actually see patients across all ages uh, in regards to patients who have a condition like narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a condition that the most prominent symptom, and really we say is the most sensitive symptom, meaning that every single patient with narcolepsy has it, is excessive daytime sleepiness. However, the challenge is when you look at the landscape of the United States, more than 20% of our population has excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, I had mentioned earlier that this most frequently is a pediatric onset condition, however, is plagued with a significant delay in diagnosis. Although most, most literature is going to say eight to 10 years, most recent literature is demonstrating at least a third of patients are waiting almost two decades before diagnosis. Now, you may say, how is that possible? How can we be missing people falling asleep? Well, number one, because sleepiness is so common, we're mistaking it as normal and giving ex explanations and excuses for it. Number two, sleepiness can have many faces. So in my prepubescent child, my younger kiddos, they can look like ADHD hyperactive type because they're kind of utilizing a lot of movement in order to be able to stay awake. For my teenagers, especially for my teenage girls, there can be a lot of mood instability related to sleepiness. And so they get labeled as depression or anxiety or some other feature. And then of course, there's always the mislabeling of potentially being lazy. Now, when people are finally getting in the hands of the right person to be able to say, I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm listening to the words you're using, and this isn't that you're lazy, if you're not depressed, you don't have ADHD, you have sleepiness and an inappropriate amount of sleepiness that is invading to all aspects of your life. You're failing in school or missing lots of days, you can't hold a job, you're not doing the extracurriculars, you're really suffering from impaired quality of life, they then are going to start doing some investigations to try and decipher exactly what it is. If you're in the hands of a sleep physician, most typically we're going to ask for a person to keep a sleep diary. Many times we'll ask them to wear a wrist-worn device called an actigraphy. Think about an Apple or Fitbit or even an Aura ring. They're able to give good estimations of what your sleep and wake schedules are. Very frequently for a person who has narcolepsy, we're seeing that this sleep-wake schedule is highly inappropriate. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're we're going to ask for you to complete an in-lab overnight sleep test or otherwise known as a polysomnography with a next day multiple sleep latency test. So what are these tests? So the overnight test, we ask for you to come in the evening. We're going to hook you up with a bunch of wires. We're then going to watch you sleep. When we're watching you sleep, there are several things that we're looking at. Number one, we're trying to exclude the idea that there, there may be another explanation for your sleep problems, something like obstructive sleep apnea or excessive periodic limb movements or insufficient sleep. Maybe you're only sleeping for four or five hours. The next thing that we're also going to be looking at is really going to be the details of that sleep study, because with the revisions of the most recent International Classification of Sleep Disorders, Edition 3 text revision, it now includes for narcolepsy type 1 a sleep onset REM period on your overnight polysomnography, meaning that most people should not go into REM sleep for 90 to 120 minutes, but people who have narcolepsy have an inappropriate relationship with REM sleep and typically will go into it in less than 15 minutes. And so if we see that when you fall asleep, you're almost immediately going into REM sleep, that's gonna be our first tip off. And for people who also have clinical features of cataplexy, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, that also can be diagnostic. So let's say you finish that overnight polysomnography, we don't have an alternative better explanation, you then wake up in the following morning, and about two hours later, we say, we want you to try and take a nap. And you'll do that four to five times, separated by about two hours each. And we're looking at how quickly, one, do you go to sleep? How quick you leave fall asleep? And then again, do you go into REM sleep? The diagnosis of narcolepsy, if I'm exclusively going to use this type of testing, is going to demonstrate on that average sleep latency, you're falling asleep on those naps 
on average in less than eight minutes, and that we're going to see two or more of what we call these sleep onset REM periods or SOREMs. And that is gonna be diagnostic for the condition for narcolepsy. So we've seen over the last few years, an explosion of new treatment options becoming available. When you look at the landscape of medications that have been available historically, we're really talking about the initial treatments being things like traditional stimulants, your methylphenidates and your amphetamines. You then saw in 2002 that the initial oxabates received their approval for cataplexy alone. A few years later, they received an approval for excessive daytime sleepiness. Now, these were your immediate release twice nightly medications that have a half-life about 30 minutes. So they required twice nightly dosing in order to sustain the entire night. We then saw medications like modafinil, armodafinil, which are characterized as what's called alerting agents. These are medications that are working on your dopamine system to help in augmenting your degree of, uh, of being awake. In addition to that, since um, uh, around 2018, we now have started seeing other medications such as uh, patolescent, which is working, working on your histamine system, which is a daytime medication for excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy in adults. It just recently got an approval for excessive daytime sleepiness and pediatric narcolepsy. You had twice nightly mixed salts oxabate, which is a alternative variation of your twice nightly sodium oxabate available for excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy. And then also Solramphetol, which is an, a, an alerting agent promoting wakefulness. Now, when you look at all those medications I reviewed, the ones that do have approval for use in pediatrics include your traditional stimulants. We're using them in ADHD anyway. Uh, and so that's for six and older for a diagnosis of narcolepsy. Both twice nightly oxabates have an approval for seven years and older, which was based on a phase three pivotal trial of a double blind randomized withdrawal in children seven to 17 years old with narcolepsy. And then just recently, as I mentioned, the treatment of patolescent for six years and older for excessive daytime sleepiness alone. So really, if we wanted to treat anything more than excessive daytime sleepiness, the twice nightly oxabates were really our only option. Rumrise is a medication that has only re received its approval uh, for pediatrics just recently. However, we have been utilizing it for well over a year now for adults with narcolepsy. This is a once nightly extended release oxabate that does have an FDA orphan designation of exclusivity over both twice nightly oxabates for clinical superiority because it's not causing any type of force disruption and allowing for an entire night's sleep. Now, this is a really important indication because of the fact that when looking at the condition of narcolepsy, we must specifically are characterizing it by a pentad of symptoms. I've commented on the fact that excessive daytime sleepiness is the most common symptom, the most sensitive symptom. However, it has this REM dissociation. So they also may experience symptoms of sleep paralysis, feeling frozen or stuck as they're falling asleep or waking up, sleep-related hallucinations, seeing things, hearing things, feeling things that aren't really there as they're falling asleep and waking up. And finally, also cataplexy is another REM dissociative feature, which many times we're describing as these transient episodes of loss of tone, most frequently in response to a strong emotional stimuli. However, in children, we know since at least 2011, Dr. Plotzi out of Italy had published in Brain that there can be active motor phenomena phenomena that are occurring in uh, children in those with new onset, including eyebrow raising, tongue thrusting, abnormal movements, all which can be mischaracterized as things like tics. But finally, another symptom that very frequently is overlooked is the innate sleep state instability that patients with narcolepsy have, and so therefore have disturbed nocturnal sleep or sleep fragmentation. So it's a condition that people are suffering with the difficulty in being able to maintain a full night's sleep. The introduction of having a once nightly extended release oxabate not only is treating excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, but is thoughtfully reflecting on not needing 
to exacerbate the disturbed nocturnal sleep with a forced awakening, allowing for you to take a medication at that time and let it do its thing throughout the night for you to experience the benefit with improved excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy the following day. The message is, is treat the person who's in front of you. None of these medications are one size fits all solutions. And so seeing the expansion of the Oxabate market has now introduced an opportunity to treat more individuals. When we reflect on, although there's been an expansion of medications becoming available, we still see that less than 20% of individuals with a diagnosis of narcolepsy are either receiving or have been offered an Oxabate as a treatment option. Some of this has to do with challenges on the clinician side, and some have to do with challenges on the patient side. If you have not considered an oxabate before, whether it was due to the twice nightly dosing or discomfort in how to be able to, to manipulate that to treat your patient, this now introduces an option that may have less complexity that concerns you. With that stated, all of the oxabates may be solutions that can fit more patients. And being able to introduce Three different options really allows for you to treat every individual in a unique way that they may need personalized for them to be successful. One thing that I do think is really important in a call to action for any of the providers who may be reflecting on uh, the diagnosis of narcolepsy is the fact that this is a condition that we frequently are missing. In general, these are patients who may have other sleep comorbidity, such as obstructive sleep apnea. So making sure that we're being thoughtful and recognizing that the symptoms of narcolepsy may be characterized by these different features of the pentad, you don't need all of them to exist, and that making sure that you're treating to the symptoms the patient is describing to you. It's not uncommon that we're utilizing something like the upward sleepiness scale to characterize the degree of sleepiness. However, the patients who are coming before you are generally describing the life impact and that should be your treatment goal. Make sure you're using all the tools in your, to uh, in your tool belt in order to be able to treat the whole person.